Um, welcome to this uh, event today. Uh, my name is Angelica Basquera. I'm representing here the Center of African Studies um, of the SOAS, uh, of SOAS University of London. And um, we are very pleased today uh, to host in our um, weekly seminar series uh, two incredible authors uh, uh, from Sudan, Ruba El Melik and Reem Abbas. Uh, welcome, and uh, we are very pleased to um, to have you here today with us, Lon Chin, uh, your very interesting book um, entitled uh, Undoing Resistance, Authoritarianism and Attacks on the Arts in Sudan, 30 Years of Islamic Rule. Um, and uh, the book has been published by uh, Andaria, a very um, innovative um, uh, digital platform. And today we also have here um, um, the editor of the of the platform, Omnia Shokat. Uh, welcome, Omnia. We are very pleased to then hear from you as well as the publisher, uh, as well as uh, about the digital platform that um, um, seems extremely, extremely innovative. Uh, finally, I also want to thank the chair uh, of the event today, uh, Mr. Paul Asquit, who is a, a research associate of the Center of African Studies, uh, but is also co-founder, uh, co co-director of Shabaka, who is, uh, um, as many of you know, a very interesting organization working on uh, diaspora engagement in the Sudan. Uh, and Paul is here uh, chairing the event and also representing uh, Shabaka as one of the organization involved in today's uh, book launch. Um, so, as I said, you know, we are very, very uh, honored to have you here. We are all uh, looking forward to this very interesting discussion uh, about your book. Uh, we have quite a lot of people registered uh, online. Uh, we are very pleased to, uh, to see people coming from different parts of the, of the world. And, um, and then uh, uh, the format will be, I will, I will pass it on to the chair now. Um, the audience will have a chance to ask the question by putting them in the Q&A box. Unfortunately, uh, we are not allowed to open the, the mics, but if you can kindly write your question in the Q&A uh, chat, and then uh, Paul will aim to pick as many questions as possible uh, within the time frame we have tonight. Uh, just to say also that the event is uh, recorded, Therefore, and it's going to be available on the SOAS YouTube channel a few days after today. Uh, therefore, if any of your friends or colleagues missed the event, uh, please share the link afterwards. Uh, it will be on the SOAS YouTube channel and we will share it with, 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 the, with the attendees. Um, I am not going to take too much time because there is a pack agenda here. Uh, the book has so many um, different aspects that we would like to, to talk about today. Uh, so I just want to say thank you again so much from SOAS, from the Center of African Studies at SOAS, uh, for uh, coming here today in one of our seminar. We are very, very uh, delighted. I'll pass it now on to Paul Asquith, the chair who is going to talk a little bit more about the authors uh, before and then uh, uh, managing the discussion. Many thanks, and I pass it on to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Angelica, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are uh, joining us from in whatever time zone you're in. It's a great honour and a pleasure to be with you here today and with our uh, very special guests for this discussion about uh, a new book that's being launched called Undoing Resistance, Authoritarianism and Attacks on the Arts in Sudan's 30 Years of Islamist Rule. And uh, thanks to Angelica for a very kind introduction. I think she's actually promoted me without realising it. Uh, I'm Director of Research at Shabaka. I'm not one of the co-founders, but uh, 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 thank you in any case. Um, in terms of the format for the event today, we're going to have a, dis a, a panel discussion with the authors. So I'm going to ask questions of uh, esteemed authors that we've got here, who I'll introduce in just a second. And then there will be an opportunity, as Angelica has said, for audience members to post their own questions into the chat box, which I will then uh, uh, ask of the authors. So with no further ado, let me start by uh, introducing our authors uh, for today. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, the discussion and really about the book. And I have to say, when I was in Khartoum in November and I uh, was able to, able to meet with Andrea colleagues who told me about the book, I uh, was incredibly excited. And I thought, well, we have to try and do a launch event around this in partnership with uh, the Centre of African Studies at SOAS uh, and their kind of weekly seminar series. 
So with no further ado, please let me introduce our uh, two esteemed authors. The first is Rubail Malik, who is an independent researcher with a social cultural anthropology degree from UCLA. And she's interested in progressing solutions to social issues through research, ethnography, and collaborations with local community organizers. Her research interests include arts, education, indigenous languages, and paradigms of gender and race that shape the lived experiences of women. Her non-academic work has included production and editorial work for the literary journal, Mizna, Swinalitz Plus Art, as well as literary programming, musical festival curation, and grassroots open access initiatives. She's invested in shaping futures for cultural expression by creating possibilities for African scholarship on the continent that exist outside of institutions. And our second esteemed author today is Reem Abes, who's a freelance Sudanese journalist, writer, researcher, and communications expert. She's been working in the field of communications and advocacy for Sudanese civil society groups and international organizations for more than a decade. Her writings on press freedom have appeared on the Index on Censorship and the Doha Center for Media Freedom, and her sociopolitical commentary was published in the Christian Science Monitor, the Washington Post, the Nation, Era News, amongst other publications. She's also spent years working with Sudanese refugees in Egypt and published a profile on young refugee musicians in the book Voices in Refuge, published by the American University of Cairo Press. Her latest writing an essay titled Smuggling Books into Sudan, A Brief History from 2012 to 2016, was published in Art and Sociology Reader, Radical Actions, Politics and Friendships, a reader published by Valets and supported by the Office of Contemporary Art in Norway. And so thank you once again for being with us here today. I also need to introduce uh, uh, Omnia Shaukat from Andrea, is a very good partner of us at Shavaka. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And before I start uh, asking questions of our esteemed authors, maybe Omnia, you could just say a few words about uh, uh, Andrea's interest in the book and how the, your journey in publishing it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks to the attendees as well. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you for your interest in our book um, and in this really incredible publication of stories as well as um, history and narration. Um, I'm really excited for everyone to read the book and I'm looking forward to following your feedback. It's our first book at Andaria, um, and it's quite an interesting sort of trajectory because we started as a um, digital cultural platform in English and Arabic for Sudan and South Sudan. We later expanded into Uganda and now we're in 12 countries in the East and North, um, sorry, in the East and, and Horn of Africa region. Um, our focus is really positive stories. So telling positive cultural stories, we later expanded into having culture exchange projects between these different countries that we operate in, as well as research. And how we stumbled across this book is really just so interesting and, and very Sudanese in a way, because you know, I, I know Ruba's sister and then somehow I met Ruba and she was just a graduate coming um, with so many questions about what's going on with Sudan, especially around the revolution time. And Reem is my sister, a lot of people know that. She's also a journalist and she's also someone who's always probing into the narrative and creating stories that are extremely rooted in the, the context of Sudan, the people of Sudan, their stories, as well as really correcting the narrative about what's going on um, with media in general or international media, but also local media and blogs and so on. Um, so it was really natural for us to take an interest in this project, connect the two together and embark on this really long journey. It, it took us three years to go from beginning to end. Um, it started in 2020 and it ended in 2022. It's actually still actually just starting. It feels like it's just starting because we're just talking about the book right now. It's blossoming really right now. Um, but yeah, so they came together and we um, found an opportunity with the uh, Arab Fund for Arts and Culture and Arab Council for the Social Sciences for a grant and we went for it and we got it. So really, really huge thanks for them. Not just for this grant because it was an essential turning point for us at Andaria, but also for their patients because it was a three-year project that was supposed to be a year and a half project. Um, I want to say a little bit about why this project is important to us and why this book is important to us. So the premise of the book is that when the revolution started, and I say started between quotations because it didn't really start in 2018, but let's say it gained momentum and it gained um, international attention in 2018, um, there was a lot of shock about the arts and how it's fueling it, whether it's diaspora generated digital arts or music, or it was local art that was chants and poetry and music and just creativity and how the, the entire movement was set up to be. And the narrative really quickly turned into something like, oh, this is something that came out of nowhere. Whereas for people who 
understand the anthropology of the place, people who study it, like Ruba, people who've been here documenting stories from 2009, like Cream. This is no shocker. There's been so many different, um, let's say, bursts of protest, bursts of resistance throughout the 30 years of Inqaz rule. But maybe the momentum that came in 2018 required that we take a minute and really go back and study all of that. And also more importantly, what was the implication of the Inqaz on this momentum? and on this resistance and how do we now look at it from the perspective of now we're in a transformational point what do we do next how do we mitigate some of the challenges that were prior and make sure that we don't face them in the future because the whole world is changing and this revolution was definitely not televised but it was televised it was twitterized if that's a if that's a word um and th there lies the importance of this book it stops in 2019 so it doesn't really go into this point that we're in right now, but it has so many lessons that it's carrying over from 30 years of work that is compiled into this 250 plus um, manuscript, basically. And I'm so excited for people to read it. I really want people to know the stories of the people. Um, I was touched so much by the stories of, of things lost. Um, there's a chapter, uh, there's a theme called memory um, of religion being misconstrued to, so that it's influencing people in all the negative ways and killing their spirits, killing their expression. We are in an African continent, in the African continent. We are part of this continent. This continent is known for rich culture, for expression. The civilizational project of the former regime really did its best to change that. And this is where we are right now and we need to take our lessons, but we also need to acknowledge that the revolution and the artistic expression that happened during the revolution came from somewhere. And I'll leave you here. Thank you so much. Over. No, thank you so much, Omnia. And maybe you've part answered uh, one of my first question, uh, questions for our esteemed guests, which is, uh, 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 how did you choose the time period for the book? You know, it covers a 30 year period, but uh, up to the end of 2018. Uh, but maybe I can uh, uh, ask our esteemed authors here, uh, maybe uh, uh, Rima or Rubha, you'd like to, to answer this from uh, your perspective. Uh, yes, hello everyone, and I would like to thank all the participants uh, for coming. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, so before I start, I just answering your question, I just wanted to tell a little story. Um, so when I started out as a journalist, I was an arts and culture reporter and editor. So, and I remember my first uh, few weeks uh, reporting for this local newspaper, I managed to convince the uh, the owner to pay for a ticket for me to go to this fashion show. And I told him, well, it's the first fashion show in Khartoum in a very long time. I have to be there. I have to cover it and so on. So I went and I, my friend went with me and we we did the interviews and so on. And then just as we left, um, the police raided the, the location and then they arrested a bunch of people. And then it was a, a basically there was a, like a, a court uh, that was happening for a very long time. And some of the people were prosecuted and we were kind of following their case. And I, I, was, I just found it very difficult to write about it. You know, what do I write in this uh, situation? And the first time was I was uh, when I wanted to interview this uh, writer. And um, when I called him because I wanted to buy his books before I do the interview, uh, he told me to that uh, his books are now all banned and that but I can buy them from this lady. So I remember I went to this um, to this place and I there was a lady selling his books from the trunk of her car. And I think this really made me realize that wow, you know, the spaces, the civic space is very limited and the civic space for um, art and culture in Sudan is very, very limited. And there's a lot of intimidation happening and, um, and there's a lot of prosecution happening to the writers, authors, artists, and so on. And I think this turned me more, I would say, into sometimes I think of myself as an activist because I, be, I became very passionate about just working for civic spaces, for freedom of expression and so on. So I think this is how kind of, you know, like uh, years later, I came to write this book with Roba. So to answer your question, Paul, um, I think for us in the beginning, we wanted to focus on the rule of al-Bashir, the Islamist rule in Sudan, 1989 to 2019. Um, so this was because we really wanted to, to write about a period that was not necessarily underreported, but, but, but we wanted to write on a period that was very interesting because 
uh, this government is unlike any other dictatorship in Sudan. I mean, Sudan is very volatile. We've always had kind of a military dictatorship happening, and we've had more than 55 years of military rule. I actually counted it today. So, but this, but the last government, the Islamist government, was very different because they they didn't have a cultural project per se, but their project, their political project was to kind of uh, basically get rid of the cultural scene in Sudan because their theory was that the cultural scene in Sudan is fueled by the left, you know, and for the, to them, the left is a bunch of communists. So for them, if they manage to kind of, um, you know, really crush this uh, cultural scene and, and prosecute artists and writers and make sure that they're not producing artwork anymore, then they kind of, uh, it, then it's going to really impact the opposition and the political opposition and so on. This is one of their, their premises. Uh, so yeah, so we wanted to write about this period because we wanted to see what happened. So what did this government do when they came to power? How did they crush the cultural scene? Because we, because we always used to hear about how Sudan had theaters and Sudan had cinemas and Sudan had this and that. But then when we were growing up, it was like, everything was shut down, you know? I mean, we, we came of age in, um, you know, in a Sudan where everything was the past, you know? They, and we knew that when this government came to power, they shut down theaters, cinemas, um, they shut down many magazines, they shut down the Sudanese Writers' Union in their first month in power, they prosecuted a lot of artists, and um, they confiscated books, they even confiscated private collections that people had in their houses. So we wanted to understand what happened, but not only that, we wanted, underst we wanted to understand how the artists and the cultural movement reacted to it. What did they do? How did they fight back, you know? And where did they find a fight back? And this is why we traveled to a few states because we wanted to know how people in different states were mobilizing. And at the same time, we also wanted to understand did, did they really succeed in crushing the, the cultural scene? And what we really saw is Yes, there was a lot of devastation, but there was also an organic, you know, decentralized cultural movement that was in that was happening in Sudan. That was amazing, and it was in so many different states. And a lot of people were so invested in just kind of continuing to be part of this resistance. Um, so yeah, so what we saw was something very, very beautiful because we saw that there were so many associations and groups that are spread across the country. And this is really the result of people coming together and mobilizing when a lot of the institutions that they used to rely on and that they were part of were no longer there because the government, sh you know, shut them down or, or closed them. Yeah, so I'll give Ruba a chance to respond. No, thank you so much, Reem. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Ruba, in terms of uh, particularly this decision, why did you choose to end the book when you did? Uh, I think uh, 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 it's uh, uh, I'm always a great proponent of uh, looking back in order to look forward. I think it's important uh, to understand where you've come from in, in order to understand where you can go in the future. But uh, Ruba, over to you. Anything you'd like to add around this? Um, yeah, of course. And I think it's exactly what you said Paul and also what Liam and Omni have touched on it's, it's that this is just the natural path of looking into the revolution so that was ultimately our in entry point into this entire thing and like where our curiosity like initially or not initially but ended up um sort of situating us at that moment in time which was you know 2019 2020 and in asking just like the very first the most shallow questions about it you're immediately led to the to the past right and you're immediately led to all these questions that take us to the 30 year period of okay what exactly has happened um up until now to get us here um and i think a huge answer to that question is is kind of these different pockets of life and cultural existence that were happening that Liam was describing um, and how those people really kept something alive in sudan in a time where it was not only dead, but very publicly and loudly declared as dead by the government and ultimately over a 30 year period by the people themselves, which is, you know, the, the in not only self-expression, but the interest in self-expression and the interest in art and like the commitment to culture. Um, and so not only were there people fighting this, but it's like, oh, okay, this actually happened extremely systematically um, and things can be traced very clearly. Um, and not only do we have like stories from multiple people that sort of reflect exactly what was going on during that time, but it just 
when you put it all together, it creates a very clear picture that just cannot be skipped over. Because if we want to move forward, um, like I think everyone here has mentioned and believes, you just you have to look at the past to understand where you are uh, in a moment in time. And for us, that was, okay, we need to look from 1989 to 2019. That 30 year period um, is absolutely the story. No, thank you. And uh, also just to add, it, it's, uh, it doesn't just cover the past 30 years, it also covers a bit beyond that. So I think that's important to stress, but really fascinating to, to read sections of it. And uh, maybe just as a quick follow up, uh, uh, I see you've organised the book around five themes, uh, uh, gender, memory, religion, conflict and governance, and finally institutions. Could you maybe just talk a little bit about your uh, choice of these themes? Um, right, so I can talk a little bit about uh, about our choice of themes and a few of the themes and then you can um, sort of take over, but um, we, we initially approached this idea of themes as maybe, you know, we were looking for theoretical frameworks to really ground us, um, and ultimately what they ended up being were very important lenses through which to understand and study what happened to the art and cultural scene and what happened to the Sudanese population and their relationship to the art and cultural scene. Um, not only over the past 30 years, like you mentioned, but honestly, like since colonialism and even before that. Um, and so we you know, had some very long and interesting discussions that led us to, to these five, you know, central themes that also just kept coming up throughout our research. And we realized that's, that's where all the stories lived and where all the theory lived. Um, and memory um, is, is one that Omnia already mentioned, so maybe I'll lead with that. And um, the memory theme is just meant to explore like this concept of collective memory as a people and as a Sudanese people and to really explore what we've lost through that and be able to, to start to grasp how important um, this concept is to Sudanese population and then also grasp what the government or the previous regime was able to do throughout their understanding of collective uh, memory and what it is, right? And so when you have a population that in the 70s and the 80s was really displaying a commitment to art or was displaying there it was the scene was flourishing or it was beginning to flourish or there was promise and obviously now we can't really say anything for sure right and that's part of the tragedy of it all but there were like there were promising moments there there was already success there were already incredible um or was incredible artistry coming out of that time um and then suddenly being led into the 90s and after that and having people stop being interested in art, it's like, what happened? And stop being inter interested in self-expression, -exp what happened? And as you move forward throughout the years, so as those generations that went through the coup in 89, um, you know, birth newer and newer generations, like maybe two, two generations down now, it's like, the question becomes, why has there been a lot of, um, self-deletion of people's own memories. So you have people becoming more conservative over time and then passing on those values to, to their new generations. And what happens is that then the past is disregarded entirely um, and um, people choose not to remember anymore. And so when that happens, it's, it leads to the question of how much agency was exercised in people's moral values um, changing over time then if they're not even able to confront their own personal pasts in a way that is honest and open um, and not judged or, or seen as wrong. Um, so this idea of collective memory, which is a combination of, of really what holds all of our, like it's a, you can, you can think of it as an intangible thing that holds all of our cultural values and that obviously a huge part of that is our relationship to art and um, a part of that is also our relationship to morality. Um, and what happened there is that the regime really played on this link between culture and morality and used memory or abused uh, folks' memory over time by closing down institutions, by burning books, which Reem can, can talk about for days, uh, by stealing people's personal archives, by going into people's home and destroying um, their different music things by like censoring paintings or destroying them or and so on and so forth. So it's like by doing that, they slowly started to erase the presence of art um, from 
Sudan as an entirety. And a huge part of that, like a lot of that is extremely visual. Like now our visual culture has suffered greatly because of this. Um, when you drive down the street, you're not really seeing, um, you know, these beautiful um, artistic institutions or you're not seeing murals on the street, like 30 years worth of murals. You're seeing two or three or four or five years worth of murals. Um, you're not seeing, uh, music concert halls and venues and and flyers and and things that just exist um, in countries where self-expression is a lot easier. Um, and that tells people this doesn't matter. And this has never mattered because you also cannot see evidence of it existing in the past anymore either. Like where are your parents' record collections? Where are the photos in the in the photo albums of them being out and about and going dancing and just just consuming? art um, and being consumers of, of culture, um, active and happy consumers of culture. So yeah, that's, that's a part of exploring, you know, the memory theme. Um, and then we have uh, the theme of religion, which is, you know, it took the, took the path of not like this discussing, okay, is art um, okay within the context of religion or within the context of Islam more specifically. It's like, no, that's actually, that question in and of itself is a trap, right? It leads us to this idea of like morality, what is okay because I want to be a good person um, and this is important to me and I've chosen these values to be my own, no. So it takes us, the religion theme really explores the use of religion as a political tool um, and the use of morality as entirely a political tool and um, really goes back um, into Sudan's history to look at how Islamism um, kind of gained the stronghold in Sudan and how during times of colonialism, it, it just sort of helped shape some quick pseudo national identity that could be used to sort of, you know, um, to, to, to create an identity for ourselves and fight off um, our colonizers and, and sort of become a country and how in the process of that, we obviously alienated the South and that's a whole different, um, or the same topic, right? But a different uh, part and um, how that ultimately led to Islamism being adopted as like a very central or being forced as being a, a very central part of our um, national and po political identity. And then having that be shuffled into these different memory channels, um, like I mentioned before as, okay, this is who we are. Um, religion is really important. Um, and we are in the business of, and you mentioned something called the civilization project, or I think maybe that was Omnia. They were in the business of creating or engineering like the ideal Sudanese person. Um, and a huge part of that was that this person was Arab, this person was Muslim, um, this person spoke Arabic and not indigenous languages. Um, and so you can imagine the kind of um, mold that they were vying for. And so religion really helped with that erasure of literally everything else outside of that mold of that one person. And that's why I think it was really important, like you mentioned, to go to different states, um, because there we're able to see how much people, which uh, the further you move from the capital, the further you're moving from this mold of like what the right Sudanese person should be. You're not and like you're not going into Arab, um, the people who are ethnically, you're not going into like the cultures or states of people who are ethnically or sorry, culturally Arab, right? You're going into people who are um, into the cultures and, and communities of people who are marginalized by the government and there's a lot of conflict there um, and seeing like, okay, this is a very limited idea of who this person is. And then religion is also used um, to, to help bolster this idea that, that the Arab, you know, almost, almost non-Black um, Sudanese person, which which obviously is nonsensical, right? Because this is a Black and African country, but this Arab um, sort of Arabic speaking uh, Muslim person is this is this makes sense racially and uh, politically and culturally and linguistically and everything, right? Um, and so yeah, so we really you know look deeper into that, and I think I mentioned conflict and governance, which is another theme. Um, and that really discusses, like I said, how when you move further from the capital, you see that 
art and culture were um, oppressed or were suppressed in different ways and to different levels of brutality by the regime. Um, it's all systematic, but whereas in Khartoum you could have neglect, like they're neglecting to fund institutions, they're neglecting to offer spaces for art and artists, they're neglecting to, you know, do things like that. Um, you have in, for example, Blue Nile, which is a bit further down south from the capital, you have people like police officers being stationed at cultural centers permanently and been given the right to run the administration of different cultural centers and having them just show up every day as like a display of prowess to be like, we are watching you. Um, and then having artists go through the honest humiliation of applying for different uh, permits and, and grants and funding to do a play or have an exhibition or a gallery or make a movie and just constantly being rejected, uh, being put through like ridiculous amounts of red tape that ultimately lead nowhere, um, having that backfire and have them being arrested for trying to do something. Um, so yeah, conflict and governance ultimately really played a huge part in how um, how the regime went about suppressing um, art in different places. And I'll let you maybe touch on the other, the, the last two themes. No, thank you so much, Reem. If, uh, yeah, if, if you'd like to add to that, and actually I think you've anticipated perhaps my next question, which is for, particularly for those uh, who are not familiar with Sudan or the Sudanese context, uh, what is it uh, uh, that motivates, why is it so important, uh, these links between art activism and revolution in Sudan. Uh, 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 I mean, this is what struck me uh, from kind of reading sections of the book, what made it so uh, powerful and topical uh, to my mind. Um, but why would, why do you think this is? Yes. Um, you know, we've, it's interesting, but in a way, um, art in Sudan, uh, music, different forms of it were always kind of resisting. Uh, I mean, we've, we've seen, um, we read some of some, uh, literature that talks about how, for example, women singers were not allowed to sing during the Mahdiya period in like the, um, towards the end of the 19th century. And after the, um, the Mahdiya rule collapsed, uh, you know, due to British colonialism, then the women singers were back kind of performing. So in a way, art was always kind of suppressed and oppressed depending on the political ideology in power. So the political and religious ideology in power. So Sudan, like I said, it, it is a very um, you know volatile country, and um, in a way, um, artists were always resisting because artists are always longing for freedom, and it's not just freedom because um, because they want to perform and they want to produce artwork and so on. It's also freedom because when you're living under a dictatorship, you can't really. Um, you can't really be like a complete artist, you know, and this is one of the, this is the sentiment that was shared with us that you cannot you cannot have uh, you cannot think clearly you cannot think freely when you're living under oppression. And this is why for artists, it was always a fight for them to to long for a state where they feel respected, where they feel that they're not prosecuted, where they feel that they can move freely, they can perform freely. Uh, so, um, so I just don't want to go really way back, but um, we've had different military dictator, uh, dictatorships in Sudan, and some of them, in a way, I wouldn't say supported the art, but they co-opted the art. So in the 70s, we had the Nehmeri dictatorship. It was more left-leaning most of its um, time in power. It did not support the art, but it kind of tried to swallow it. So it would hire artists and poets and writers into state institutions in a way to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that they are abiding by its, you know, its values. Uh, but then when, when when we came to the, the, the Islamist uh, regime, like I said, they didn't treat, they had a social, they had a social project. So their social project was called the civilizational project. Okay. And some people, we could argue that it's a social and also, and also cultural project, but it's a social project in the sense that they describe it. I mean, their godfather, uh, the godfather of the Islamist uh, movement in Sudan, he describes it as a process to re-engineer the Sudanese uh, person or the Sudanese individual. So by re-engineer, I mean that they want to, they want this person, they want the Sudanese man or woman to have their values, to share their values, or to share certain values. And this is why 
the and and of course the the civilizational project was kind of implemented through the school curriculums through the media through the state institutions through so many different channels so people were bombarded and this is why for a long time the artists were not only kind of fighting the government but they were also fighting the society because they would be performing for example and then people would see them as you know communist you know uh, you know bad people you know uh, drunk people they they would kind of stigmatize them because it's it was so embedded into people's minds that oh artists are just not good people you know they're just a bunch of people who want to kind of who have a grudge against society you know and because there, there was a lot of propaganda against artists there was a lot of propaganda against just anyone who kind of looks even looks different you know and this is why uh, there's so many uh, you know there's a lot of propaganda against people who wear who dress a certain way who have a certain lifestyle who have a certain uh, you know look basically if you have dreadlocks if you do this if you do that then it just really means that you're stereotyped and stigmatized and this is because of the mass government propaganda for a very long time so it was a situation where for artists, they were really struggling to kind of find this acceptance in the society, but also, you know, struggle against the regime. So, so yeah, so the, you know, during the, the Islamist regime, it was a full on dictatorship. And I think from the get go, the regime made sure that they targeted uh, the cultural movement. I mean, in the first, in like in the first month, basically, when they shut down, when they dissolved the parliament and they shut down, or sorry, they banned all the political parties, they also banned the Sudanese Writers Union. So this is a statement, right, that they're making from the get-go. And then after that, so they set up like torture, you know, chambers for, or like they're called ghost houses, like torture, uh, you know, detention facilities for politicians and opposition leaders and so on. And they also imprison artists, poets, and so on. So in the first few years, you see that Poets have been tortured, arrested, disappeared, and subjected to so many different things, you know? So they made very sure that from the beginning, they were targeting this kind of community. Uh, so they had no, no other basically alternative but to resist, but also because they were resisting because they really believed in kind of the different democratic values. They really believed that they wanted to see a free Sudan, free from this uh, uh, dictatorship. So it was always uh, a movement that is very much, uh, you know, that was always kind of resisting because also, like I said, the different governments looked at artists the same way they look at, op at the opposition political parties, you know, that they're their enemies, enemies of the states, you know, that they're there to get them, that they are spreading awareness and they don't want this kind of awareness because the awareness is kind of against the civilizational project, you know, that they are advocating and trying to impose. No, thank you so much, Reem. Um, I very much agree. I mean, two just initial thoughts from what you've said is one, uh, uh, just how important uh, control of arts and culture is for many political movements and revolutionary movements for precisely the reasons you've outlined. And the other is the way in which that uh, artists and kind of uh, cultural activists often can find themselves in a position of challenging or, or subverting norms within society, which can expose them to kind of backlash both at a popular level, but also at a kind of uh, uh, from on high or from the government. And, and maybe this kind of leads quite neatly into my next question too, which is uh, uh, why do you think, or what do you think is the value and importance of arts and culture in times of crisis? Yes. Um, I, I can start that and then Ruba can, uh, she, yeah, I'm sure she has a lot of addition. I mean, it, you know, in Sudan, um, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very, I mean, people look at it as a very kind of interesting thing that Sudan, uh, that this is kind of the third, 2019 was the third revolution in Sudan. Uh, so our first revolution was 1964 and then 1985, you know? So it's really, it's really inspiring that we, that all the different generations, whether it's my grandparents, my parents, and now my generation, we are trying to break loose. We're trying to break free from this, you know, status quo, basically. But it's also quite sad that we're kind of all the different revolutions somehow have very similar demands. But but in a way, this revolution, I would, we, you know, we would say um, is different because of all the all the research that we have done. It really showed that uh, there was kind of a revolutionary infrastructure in Sudan. So the revolutionary infrastructure, whether it's like 
different groups, organizations, associations, uh, independent trade unions, and uh, different uh, groups, basically. Um, and it's and we're we still see we're still seeing that even you know in the form of the Sudanese Professionals Association, Association the different political parties and so on. Uh, so the revolutionary sorry the resistance committees, not the political parties. Uh, but then also you have a cultural infrastructure, okay? And and in and and other and in and in many different countries, this cultural infrastructure is kind of governmental or it's tied to the state. You have whether it's libraries, whether it's different. Uh, you know, institutions that are kind of tied to the state. In Sudan, in most cases, this is not the case because we're talking about 30 years of, you know, really just total destruction of, you know, the government literally burning books. So, and, and, and basically raiding and shutting down so many things. So this cultural in infrastructure in Sudan is very interesting because it is organic in a way. It's organic in the sense that people had to organize and they had to organize in different states in Sudan and they had to organize in a way to kind of, um, to, uh, to have some kind of solidarity. So the artist groups or the different cultural groups in different parts in Sudan, whether for example, a Shuru cultural association, I dedicate actually this book to them. I mean, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, because I feel that they're very important. As true cultural association, for example, they completely depend on 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 just donations. You know, the the people support them. They pay their rent. They pay their you know uh, for their activities and so on. And this is how the infrastructure is is sustained. And this is how the infrastructure is able to operate independently. And it's able to kind of really rely on the community to come together. You know, and this takes a lot of work. And I'll tell you an example to show that how this was kind of done. So for example, in a Jazeera, the artists, they insist to use the, at some point they used to insist to use the state institutions to hold their events because they felt that this is a state institution. It does not belong to the, to the ruling party. It's our right to use it. So they would go to the you know, arts and cultural palace there and they would book you know, the venue to kind of hold their event. And then when they come in the evening, the guard would disappear with the key somehow. And of course, this was all, you know, it was on purpose. It was not, you know, that the guard got sick or something. It was on purpose because they wanted to, to make sure that the event does not take place. So of course, you know, at, you know, they're there and standing in front of the venue and a bunch of people are there and they had to find a way, right? So someone would kind of donate their house to have the event, you know, so they would walk or drive to someone's house and they would sit there in their, you know, in their, um, you know, like the hosh or the yard in, you know, like we call it in Sudan. And then they would just have the event, right? So this was people coming together and people finding different uh, kind of venues to hold events and people finding solidarity, right? The community had to come together and support. And so this is why the, the cultural infrastructure in Sudan is strong because people support it and people gave, like people continue to give resources to make sure that it continues to be available. So it's very important basically because right now you see this so much in the different platforms that have basically uh, that have appeared in Sudan in the past few years. Right now you have cultural cafes in so many states across Sudan. And I think this is what we found that we found, like, like, like I said, the, the cultural movement is not centralized anymore. Okay, it's not just in Khartoum right now, it's everywhere. So you have a cultural cafe in Kosti, you have a cultural cafe in Madani, in like so many different places. You have bookshops opening in different areas. You have art galleries opening up in different areas. So this really shows that people want to continue kind of having this, you know, uh, like organic kind of cultural movement. And they want to continue making sure that art has a place in Sudan, it has a place in society, it has a place in the civic space and so on. So, so in, on one hand, you have the authorities erasing the graffiti from the wall to kind of erase the revolution, to kind of erase, erase resistance, not even the revolution, erase that people were there and that people drew this and that people were resisting. But on the other hand, you have people who are saying, no, we're still here. We're going to continue doing this. We're going to continue holding events. We're going to continue to fundraise. And we're going to continue to kind of use our own spaces, houses or whatever, to have events to kind of support this movement. Thank you so much, Reem. Uh, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that, Ruba? 
Um, yeah, I'll just quickly add to that. I mean, I think that's such a, a, a perfect and uh, beautiful answer, honestly. And I just think, you know, arts and culture, they, they bring communities together, like they bring the community together, kind of like Reem was saying, and it decides, they help people decide their values um, collectively. And more importantly, and something that we're just really trying to stress in this book and by doing this is that it's a thing that is very much alive and needs to be like kept alive and it's a collective responsibility. And that's exactly what Reem was talking about. And artists in a way are the vanguards of this, right? They're the people creating and the people reflecting and the people who are almost um, painfully honest because it's impossible for them not to be, right? Because um, they're constantly reflecting their realities. But the guarding of arts and cultures is, is a collective effort, you know? And I, when I visualize this, I, I don't want it to be or like sound militant, you know, that each of us as a people like has a, you know, individual responsibility to like stand and, and guard our arts and cultures. I mean, sure, but it should just be something that people refuse to have contained, you know, like we as a collective people can make the decision to say, we refuse to be contained in this way, you know? And so you have then examples like Deem was mentioning of people selling books from their trunks, opening up their houses, even, um, even I mean, we've had very famous uh, poets in prison smuggle out their poetry, like through prison guards, you know, who are like upholders of the system, but ultimately have their own personal um, leaning or their own personal investment and, in, arts and culture. So no matter how nuanced that example is, or no matter how complicated that example is, it's this is what it looks like for a community to come together and say, we refuse to be contained. That's a value. Self-expression is important. That's a value for us. And the most important thing that needs to be mentioned in all of this is you, you also have like the, this insane amount of heartbreak and bravery and commitment coming from the artists who held on to their own work, even when it's been disregarded and disrespected. You know, we were going and interviewing people who had seven books on a USB um, or in their laptop or something that's been gathering dust for 25 years or um, trying to give us copies of their books when they have like two or three copies um, that they could just print because that was their own budget. Um, and just stories of rejection and stories. And, and still they hold on to the idea that their work is important because it literally is. Um, and that in and of itself is, is resistance, right? And, and that's like kind of why that became so important. The title of the book is revolution can be a moment in time and it's a paradigm shift and it's so important, but resistance is, is really what holds everything together. And so that's, you know, that really is the role of, of arts and culture, I would say, especially in a time of crisis. No, thank you. I, I, that was very beautifully put from uh, both of you. Uh, maybe just to, to ask a sort of follow on from that. So Sudan uh, uh, has a very rich cultural heritage that its people and its artists draw on. Um, and I get the impression that uh, Sudanese artistic creation is fizzing with creativity and dynamism and activity. But um, while Sydney's arts have uh, rightly developed a reputation around the world for, for excellence, uh, they, uh, I would argue, still deserve to be far better known. How do you think the Sydney's people and the Sydney's diaspora leverage their country's rich artistic heritage, both to raise awareness of Sudan and Sydney's art, and also to build up the arts and cultural sectors within Sudan itself? Who would like this to go first? Please, Marie, you go, you go first. Very good question. And uh, we actually had a discussion on this exact same question last week at the gallery in Khartoum. So I think it's also a conversation that people are having, and we're glad that we're a part of this conversation right now. I think the first thing I would say is people need to learn to pay for art, you know, and I think in Sudan, because you have so many different kind of, um, you know, donor or like funded institutions that have for years kind of, you know, had galleries, screenings, different events that were free. So now I think um, in a way, uh, 
you have to make it, you, you, we have to kind of work on changing the, not changing the culture, but ensuring that people understand that, you know, you have to compensate artists for their work. So you pay for a gallery, you know, you pay money for a book, uh, you know, or like it could be sometimes, you know, different prices depending on the situation, but you have to kind of make sure that the artists are compensated. Um, so right now, also, I think the culture is changing in a way that you have artists who are, you know, really selling their artwork for more like higher prices right now. And this was not the case before. They feel more confident to do that after this international recognition of Sudanese art. And also because right now the culture in Sudan is changing that people are more than willing to kind of pay more for art. And this is good. We have to make sure that artists are able to support themselves through their artwork. This is very important because we want to make sure that they continue support and they're producing it. The second thing is investing in building people. And also, I wouldn't say institutions, because I feel that in the context of Sudan, institutions are not really sustainable because you have a a government that just comes to power and they shut down everything and they destroy all the institutions. So we kind we have to kind of invest in in building people, you know, building their capacity, making sure that you know we invest in like the different art institutions that are that are not the art institutions, but like the art facilities basically that are popping in different places in Sudan, making sure that they're able to educate, spread awareness, and build the capacity of the movement. Um, there, there are some people who are doing amazing things right now, like, for example, Khaled Al Bey, an artist, uh, he has a small grant for Sudanese artists and uh, makers and shakers. So this is good, you know, I mean, like there are people who are already doing some creative things and they're supporting the movement somehow. We need more initiatives like that. The third thing is people should not be suspicious of the private sector, because I mean, there is there's some private entities that are, for example, you know, supporting the publication of books, holding events, and then and then there's this some kind of suspicion that what do they get out of it? No, they're part this they're part of uh, they're trying to commercialize the arts, you know, and so on. So I feel that also we have to kind of work on on really just you know making sure that artists can kind of benefit from different institutions, you know, whether it's private institutions and so on. Um, I'm not gonna say kind of reclaim back the state institutions that are already there, because I feel that right now it's a very vague situation. We don't know what's happening. And we've had a very difficult time with the previous government where, you know, people worked very hard to make sure that the quote unquote right people are in power and then they didn't do anything for the, for the artists and so on. They did nothing actually. Unfortunately, um, we have to stand up for art. So right now, I mean, unfortunately, just a few weeks ago, this exhibition was confiscated, like an entire exhibition, as in paintings were confiscated. So we have to stand up for art. We have to make sure that prosecution does not not happen. And when it does, we have to show solidarity. Artwork is, is as important because this is our heritage. This is our our story. Right. They are they're just, again, trying to erase our memories and they're trying to, again, uh, you know, take back stories from us. Uh, so yeah, so um, the the last thing, it's kind of, it's in, it's interesting, but basically um, when we were working on this book, uh, we really struggled with finding information because um, there's a lot of, very little writing, but also all the archive, the artistic archive is actually with people. So we really want people who have managed to kind of hold on to books, you know, um, you know, different writings and things and documents over the years and who have, you know, fled the country with them, or I don't know what, really we, like, they just have to find a way to di digitize it and make it available because we need this to be out there for us to benefit from it as researchers, but also to kind of for us to put the pieces together. So this is a special request that I'm making. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, uh, I very much uh, uh, echo that special request, but also I like the fact that you started your answer with uh, your reference to the fact that uh, artists need to get paid for their work. Uh, and uh, at Shabaka, we're big believers in uh, everyone needs to eat. Yeah. Uh, so people should be recompensed for their for their labor and the, their effort. And I'd also uh, extend that to uh, yourselves and Andrea colleagues. And I strongly encourage everyone uh, who's joined us here today to buy a copy of the book. 
and uh, I'll ask uh, some questions of yourselves and Omnia about that right at the very end. But I just wanted uh, to open the discussion out to our audience and just to say if you've got any questions for our esteemed authors, please put them in the Q&A box. We've already had a question come through, uh, which if it's OK, I will ask uh, 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 our panel in just a second. But uh, yeah, please, uh, uh, please ask your questions. It's kind of your space now. Uh, and maybe actually we, uh, we can move on to the first question we've received, which is from Hoda, uh, which is asking about the role of archaeology in both supporting authoritarian regimes or supporting uh, underground resistance artistic movements. Uh, and around the questions around the use of ancient culture in constructing current struggles. Um, uh, what are your uh, immediate reflections on this? I'll start with you, Ulva, if that's okay. Yeah, I love that question. I just have to say that I think that's um, uh, so, so very interesting. Um, so there's, I, I touched on this a little bit in the book, but yeah, I think it's like a, a, an extremely interesting question. I think that archaeology, at least in Sudan right now, is currently so like it's definitely more on the side of support supporting authoritarian regimes. And the way that happens is because it's sort of um, helps the current population detach themselves from their ethnic and um, racial and cultural histories and feel like they're part of um, a lineage that makes sense. And um, uh, there's a part in the in the book where we talk about how like if you're trying to construct a, a timeline of Sudanese history, you'll have like um, Al Mahdiya in the late um, 1880s, and then you have um, colonialism and then the you know the fight against colonialism and then you have independence um, and then you have a few dictatorships and and now you're here and when you look at that you're just kind of astounded because it feels like a very uh, short history um, and in a way it really is like this sort of our his like postmodern or post colonial um, history is extremely short, and that's something that we're also not thinking about enough at all. Um, and um, just a, a quick digression from there is uh, Reem, Reem's thing is she always says, please buy art. And my thing is, I always say, please read more um, because we do have a lot of like learning to catch up on. And I think both those things are very important, just consumption in different ways. Um, but that is all to say that I think archaeology, and I hope this is not a hot take, is helping um, or help the regime keep things very ahistorical and keep things very uh, revisionist for an extremely long period of time and helped make people feel detached so they'll have you know um not that they cared about it very much also because we have this this incredibly um sort of abusive relationship with our material um history and material culture um where the government truly does not care about preserving any of this and so we have you know um European or Western archaeologists coming in and like taking artifacts um, and sometimes that's literally supported by the government and then on top of that those people are then like lauded as heroes almost for helping us discover like our own history um, but ultimately when that happens you you just construct something that you feel is ancient even though we literally have um we literally have current understandings of how our history ties into different people today and different ethnic groups and people know this about themselves and we have all of these indigenous languages that are now dying because while well, the government is saying you know um, anything archaeological is super in the past that's like almost a different thing that's not us right now you have them at the same time very systematically arabizing the country erasing indigenous language um, and so use Using all of these indigenous artifacts to help sort of widen the gap between people and literally where they come from ultimately very much leads to this like national or sort of identity crisis that's very much talked about in Sudan of like what are we are we African are we Arab um, are we Muslim are we not like what is it what does it all mean um, and how like I think really like within so many Sudanese people there's like so like all of these internal questions and and this goes back to the collective memory is like after you run the tape back a little bit you blank and even while you're running the tape back over like the years that you've lived or the past 30 years or just like very current 
history, you still have like a lot of a lot of blank moments. And that reminds me of something, a story that like is in the book of how th there that also happens in a literal sense. And like when Neem is talking about the archives being um, destroyed and how there was once um, an, um, a TV show that was that was aired on TV, an older TV show, and they had episodes missing because the reels were destroyed or they didn't work anymore or they were destroyed because of censorship or neglect. And so you just had them airing like episodes and then the ones that were missing were just missing. And so you have literally an incomplete story. And I think that's like very poignant. And so, yeah, archaeology kind of helps or the the abuse of of our material culture. Um, yeah, definitely helps kind of situate our history in a way where we're very, very detached um, from it, um, if that makes sense. But yeah. I'm, not, uh, I'm muting myself when I didn't mean to. Thank you so much. I, uh, I think this is a really interesting area. Uh, I can see we've got another question from Ahmed Al Effendi, and it's great to see you on the Ahmed about will we so someday see a whole contemporary artistic museum in Sudan in the near future? Uh, and maybe before I ask your views on this, I'll, uh, I would I would like to preface it by saying I very much hope so. Uh, not least because so much of Sudan's cultural heritage, unfortunately, along with other African states, uh, is sitting outside of Sudan, often in museums, libraries, collections in Europe and North America and other places. And it's been very pleasing to see a movement uh, 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 grow in uh, uh, force over the past couple of years in particular, and especially since the uh, tragic death of George Floyd in the Black Lives Matter process in 2020, for increasing restitution of stolen cultural artifacts and human remains to uh, uh, origin countries. Uh, and uh, just draw, a, I'll give a quick shout out to a sister organization of Shabaka called the African Foundation for Development or Afford. Uh, you've got a very interesting project around this called Return of the Icons, which is working with policymakers, but also institutions uh, within Africa, but also uh, in Europe and North America to return these stolen artifacts and human remains. So yeah, what are your views, uh, Reem, what do you make about this? Will we see a museum, a contemporary yes. artistic museum, and also maybe a historical one as well, that uh, uh, bearing in mind, what's the um, famous quote? Uh, the one who controls the past controls the future. So Absolutely. the way in which history is such a contested uh, uh, state for governments, but also people. Yeah, um, I think um, my answer is going to be a bit controversial because, I mean, I understand. I think there are so many countries right now that are more stable. But in this, in the context of Sudan, because we have interviewed people, we have written about that. We have heard people say how security forces raided and confiscated their private collections. So you had people having their entire libraries, you know, confiscated. And it's not only books and artwork and so on, but it, it's even like pictures of their children, you know? So, so I think right now in this very like volatile situation and this like political uncertainty, I think everything needs to stay put. <laughs> everything needs to stay put in the sense that, um, I mean, I encourage everyone with um, with an archive to share it, digitize it, make sure that it's available somehow, okay, on the internet for for us to look at it and to benefit from it. But I but I think right now this is not the right time to talk about it. Uh, you know, going to the like the national archives because it's under not only there's this political uh, uncertainty, it's underfunded. A lot of things unfortunately get lost and. And also um, a lot of it is on purpose. I mean, on purpose, they want to erase a lot of the things that we have. Um, so yeah, it is a controversial um, answer, but because but we have seen so much pain, you know, uh, during the interview. So I really uh, believe that uh, right now, this is the right answer. I think that's a really interesting answer actually, because although I would argue, and uh, certainly our partners at Afford argued that the moral and ethical case for returns is uh, unanswerable, there are very real practical considerations depending on uh, the, uh, the complexity of the situation within origin countries where artifacts uh, were taken from. Uh, and it may not, it's not always just as simple as give it straight back, particularly mm -hmm. if uh, the institutions uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 are insufficiently resourced or there's uh, uh, insufficient 
uh, or too much political interference, perhaps. So I, I, I very much kind of note your point there. Um, also, I can see we've got a question from uh, an anonymous attendee who's asking for a bit more information about the confiscated art uh, gallery uh, stroke event. And could you yeah. also repeat the name of the local NGO you mentioned? Yeah, the local NGO I mentioned, I think he's talking, uh, he, he means or she means uh, um, Al Shuruq, Al Shuruq Cultural Al Shuruq. Forum. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's in Gadarif in the eastern part of Sudan, and it's just uh, it's an amazing basically institution. To answer your question, so the event I was talking about was um, um, just uh, it was end of last year. It was in October. Um, there was an exhibition organized at this uh, place in uh, in Khartoum, and the exhibition was actually it was all the theme was like revolutionary art, and there was a lot of paintings on like you know political detention and so on, and um, basically the security they they raided the the exhibition, they confiscated the paintings and they arrested a bunch of people, and. People were just very, it, there, it was a lot of anger. I just feel that the anger was not as much as as, as it should be because the paintings, I mean, I, the, there were some pictures that were shared online and they were very beautiful, you know, very beautiful because they really document the struggle that is happening. So unfortunately, yeah, they were confiscated and no one know, of course, you know, they will not be, um, you know, returned. And um, it was it was quite sad, actually. I'm going to... I'm going to answer to you and then I'm going to just kind of put the link. Um, okay, the I don't see a, the question anymore to be honest, but there's a, uh, yeah. But anyway, there's a link you can go to civic uh, civicmonitor.org. It's like a Sudanese organization and then you could find the um, uh, kind of a link to it over there. No, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's a, a very kind of, it's interesting to learn more about that, but also to provide information about it. Um, I can see we've got a question in the chat from Christine, who is asking uh, uh, the panelists to talk about some of the performances, music, books, or other works of art they saw during their research, particularly outside of uh, uh, Khartoum that they were uh, that were your favorites or something you really enjoyed and uh, also does it include humor and comedy uh Ruba, maybe i'll kind of ask you first yeah um that's that's such a lovely question thank you for that christine um yeah i think especially in states outside outside of khartoum i like some of my favorite moments were seeing um, instruments that I hadn't heard before and like musical scales that I hadn't heard before. So an example of that was in um, Damazin, which is a city in Blue Nile State um, that I mentioned before, more to the south. Um, they they had this, I interviewed the, the sort of troop leader or band leader of this band called Firqat al -Waza, and they um, used this, it's, you know, the, the name of the band is named after an instrument um, that they uh, sort of, it's, it's, it's really, um, yeah, I don't know, I just never seen it before, right, and I never heard it before, and um, it, Blue Nile is kind of known for that, but um, it was just really interesting to to be able to witness it and see it um, and hear it and really reflect on the fact that this is like not wildly widely available, even though it's literally a form of like an, a Sudanese instrument and it's not um, as easily accessible, just even sonically to literally listen to um, as like the tambour, for example, which um, comes out of the North. Um, and so that was uh, like one moment that was um, incredibly beautiful. And um, another was, I think I interviewed um, a, a playwright who, after our interview, sort of launched into just uh, doing a monologue uh, from a play, and it was it was just really it was really incredible to I don't know just see people be so joyful and in their element and um, and just uh, and just I don't know just kind of see that happen. Um, and then uh, what else? I mean that I could go on forever. There was like a professor of music and art who like showed me an excerpt from his book and it was it was so lovely. Um, and these things happen outside of research as well. Like I've literally met like outside our research project as well, right? Like I literally like have met artists um, in the airport gate uh, waiting for flights back to Khartoum who are like, oh my God, look at my uh, song or my poetry um, or my this or my that. And it's just, um, yeah, I think I, I any moment where we're able to encounter 
that was just like very joyful but those are definitely some of the the ones that come to mind and um and and were just really amazing about leaving Khartoum and, and being able to witness um artists there and then in terms of humor and comedy I think that's a very interesting question um yeah I mean I think I think humor generally like from a personal standpoint is something that keeps us alive literally because it just helps us cope with the times and everything that is happening and um I don't think it's a coincidence that maybe the funniest people that I've even met uh during our field work were like some of the artists that I interviewed outside of um Khartoum and like in different states who have been through like such difficult times and would just sit there and um and and make me laugh because the way that they discuss everything ultimately they have this attitude of well you know it's really not our loss um that this is these population is not invested in in art it's it's really theirs you know and it's really not our loss that like Khartoum for example is um regarded as the epicenter of Sudanese art it's it's Khartoum's loss because our art is better objectively you know and just having that sort of um attitude and that sense of humor and that um and that just yeah that that's I think is, is something that has exhibited itself as part of artists lives but humor generally and comedy generally I mean I think um how that factors into it I don't know I think that's a that is a very interesting different question yeah I don't know if you want to I think that's a really interesting uh, answer actually uh, yeah. not least because of how integral culture is to identity and identity is to culture and the interplay between the two but uh, Reem uh, what uh, would you like to nominate some kind of favorite forms of artistic or cultural expression that you encountered uh, over the course of uh, writing and producing the book yeah I mean to be honest um writing the book it, it really introduced me to a lot of books that were written on like songs and you know cultural history in Sudan and uh, some books were very rare and it was very difficult to find but it really showed that a lot of the books that are kind of very specialized on this topic are kind of out of print or it's just very difficult to find to find them but uh, with the support of some publishers I was able to get a few copies and I'm very grateful that I now have copies of them uh, but also some of the things that I really enjoyed is um, every time we would, I would kind of interview and I remember I was in Al Jazeera you know with Madani uh, and every time we would kind of I would interview an artist a musician and so on they would always perform you know they were always kind of willing to kind of you know uh, tell me a poem, you know, play a song. And I remember we had this interview and we went to, uh, we, um, the interview location was, as, was, was at this uh, like club, uh, it was called the Graduates Club. So we went there and then we were doing the interviews and all of a sudden, uh, so many different artists were, you know, came to the location, to the venue. And then we had a, uh, you know, a celebration outside, people were singing and this people were laughing and dancing. And uh, we had this famous musician just kind of come in and, and then he played a few of his songs. So it was really nice to kind of feel that people are just very generous with their with their hard work. They're very generous with their time. They were very generous in kind of just letting you into their space, you know, and I really appreciated that. Um, a funny thing that I remember talking about, you know, humor and comedy is I think like right now when people are telling you stories that at the time, of course, were very painful, they, they, they can see humor in them. Like one example is uh, this, um, this group and it was in the 1990s and they were at the time, they were just kind of university students who came together and they wanted to form kind of a theater troupe or a theater group. So they were performing this like Shakespearean play in like, you know, downtown Khartoum near the University of Khartoum. And they were in full, you know, costume basically and then the the police came and they raided the place and 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 he was telling me the the one of the uh you know actors that it was really funny how they were lap they were kind of running down the street like down university street in like full costume looking like just you know like they're they are out of this world and the police is chasing them and then the audience is chasing the police and he said it just looked crazy, you know. Now, when you when you look back, it just it's very very funny. But um, but at the time, this is just really how they dealt with. So he said, you know, it just really made us think that even if you're wearing costume, you always have to wear comfortable shoes because you you just know that you have to run all the time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, thank you so much for, for sharing that, Liam. And uh, I, I very much agree. It's really nice to hear uh, the, uh, the, the humour from both your anecdotes and both your experiences. It's, it's quite touching. Um, the next question, just to change topic slightly, is around gender. It's from uh, Lina. And she says, uh, 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 it often feels that for women, when it comes to political activism, the fight takes place on multiple fronts. I'm thinking particularly of what happens on the streets, where we are especially vulnerable to sexual assault from military aggressors and even allies. I wonder if you could please speak about that overwhelming burden and what can, what, if anything, can be done about it. So uh, I don't know what your reflections are on this. Uh, maybe you want to start on that? Um, actually, I'm going to give this one to Liam because um, she wrote in some incredible chapters under the gender theme and I think maybe didn't have a chance to talk on that a little bit earlier. So, um, yeah, this is just maybe the perfect time. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, I think when we when we were discussing the themes, we, we selected the, the, the theme gender because we felt that like women have completely different experiences, you know? I mean, the prosecution was kind of at, you know, uh, was um, affecting everyone, all the artists, but women, their experiences were very particular because for example, you know, uh, in, the 90, in the early 1990s, um, you know, women uh, were, kind, were banned, you know, from the radio station. So, you know, songs by women were banned, especially love songs girl songs like we call them in Sudan. So so the spaces for women to perform were very limited. The spaces for, were, for them to kind of uh, move were very limited, you know? And um, also, I mean, we've seen artists like um, Hanan Bulbulu, for example, who basically, she was a performer uh, and, and Jawahir, for example, they were performers actually, they were not singers. But then they became musicians. Why? Because they couldn't perform anymore. So we saw a lot of um, uh, a lot of different professions actually disappear. They had to adapt to the new setup because they were at risk. You know, uh, many left the country. Um, the ones that remained really had to really struggle and and fight a system that had laws and that had a whole bunch of infrastructure to kind of uh, criminalize uh, the behavior of women in general and of women. Um, you know, artists in specific. So for, for the musicians, for example, it was, uh, they were more likely to get arrested. They were more likely to get uh, prosecuted. And they were, of course, um, uh, women were very limited in like, um, when it comes to performance, because so they had to like dress in a certain way or otherwise they would not be allowed to perform. Um, and also for women writers, okay? I mean, we, I do have a little thing about women writers, and uh, for women writers, they would kind of, they would face a lot of threats. They would face um, uh, some kind of stigma uh, and they would be threatened with people who were telling them that, or like the security system, a security apparatus would kind of uh, let them know that they would tarnish their reputation, you know, and kind of spread rumors about them if they continue kind of writing and producing work and so on. So it was a very difficult, you know, uh, context for women. And, and uh, it was, um, and I think this is why uh, if you look, for example, at the like women, especially women writers and, 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 and so on, um, so many enter the, the field and then they just kind of drop out and they, they disappear because it takes a lot of gut and it takes a lot of uh, social support for you to kind of keep going. Uh, so I think the answer is very difficult, but I think, realizing that for women their activism and their presence in the public space is kind of continue to be continues to be criminalized by the state and by the state apparatus is in itself you know uh, an uh, an entry point and then the next thing is to understand that part of the violence against women on the street whether it's sexual assault harassment by the state apparatus is to keep the is to is to make sure that they go back to their homes and this is what we're always kind of told we're on the streets go home what are you doing here you know because it's a way they're telling us you don't own the streets you know you should be at home so there's only the only way is to keep speaking out absolutely but also to just um, document it to talk about it and uh, everyone should just kind of spread the word and write about this and uh, uh, you know, we we don't want this. We don't want to be silent, and we want this to be exposed, basically, on so many different levels. 
No, thank you so much, Reem. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, Rabah? Um, I think that's a that's a good an that's a great answer. Yeah. Well, I'm slightly mindful of time as well. So just a, a final call for any questions from our audience. But also, uh, 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 I know uh, at the very start, we talked about the need to look back in order to look forward. Um, I suppose I had a question for you both looking forward, which is that the uh, 2019 popular revolution in Sudan and uh, what were Africa's largest ruling street protests until very late last year have been an inspiration for many both uh, in the diaspora, but also around the world in other countries. What role do you think art has in popularizing and also maintaining the fight for a return to civilian-led democratic rule? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think, I think art is generally like a facilitator between, you know, like systems of power and then the people that are trying to shape um, culture where, Whereas where like whether they're artists or people who are trying to do that for their own political um, agendas. And so just like acknowledging that that is um, a relationship that exists and has been uh, so far flowing from one side to the other, like basically the previous regime was really using arts and culture as almost like um, an, an um, an IV drip of like propaganda, right? Um, of like and trying to embed people with all these different like values and and ideas of who they're supposed to be. Um, and so, so when you, I think after the revolution, what happened was that once the space for self-expression increased, it was very hard to push that back in. And, you know, artists started to find audiences, uh, which is really important and like what Shadim has talked about and spaces and, just discover their own sense of autonomy. Um, and I think that is something that trickles um, into the general population because when you have um, the people who are the most oppressed get be able to have more space um, or more, more marginalized in the community, be able to have more space to self-express and be present and be um, visible and um, resist and then be able to actually see um, Results. I mean, I mean, and, and we know that, like, in the past few years, those sort of results were, um, you know, things things have become more heartbreaking again. But still, they were able to see something like tangible results, and so that connection between the two, um, and that reversal of, oh, actually, we can use um, this relationship that um, has been set in place between um, systems of power um, and arts and culture and we can use that for our own good and we can be loud about our resistance and then directly lead it to saying, okay, I'm an artist, I'm producing art, I'm flooding the streets with art and um, music and, and just uh, all forms of um, cultural expression. And the point here is we want um, civilian led rule, right? We, or we don't want a dictatorship or we don't want a military government. Um, and so I think the revolution really helped um, really cement the, the pipeline or the link between the two and have both of them constantly come up in conversation with each other and use that as kind of like a cultural training because a lot of um, the answers to all of these big questions are just extremely literal things like buy more art um, or learn more about history, whether through like any form of learning, right? Like reading online, talking to people, oral histories, going to uh, museums and, and maybe doing more research beyond that and um, listening to resistance and being able to be a part of it and then also contextualize it and absorb the messages that are being put out of, okay, we actually have the autonomy or we should have the autonomy and the agency to decide um, the actual literal political future of this country um, and structure of this country. And the way to do that is to start to form an opinion and to have one that makes sense and, and, and yeah, to become um, a person who is very invested in shaping the country's future. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Maybe just a quick follow up around that. I can see a question from Hoda in the chat about does the government also have its own art propaganda machine in the Ministry of Culture? Uh, yes, I can take that question. And we actually so we have an example in the book. And to be honest, we were very careful, like framing it, because we also didn't want to 
kind of point fingers, but after the Arab Spring protests, so after the Arab Spring in 2010, you know, and 11 and 12 and so on, the government wanted to kind of, they knew that it would kind of spread to Sudan because Sudan was already kind of seeing some kind of protest movement. So they wanted to absorb the anger. So what they did is they started kind of supporting, you know, plays and different kind of artistic work that would kind of appear that it's like revolutionary and that it's kind of allowing this space to kind of have a dialogue about political change in Sudan and so on. But the reality is it was like very controlled, you know, material, you know, because like I said, they wanted to absorb the anger and they also wanted to kind of, um, to, 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 uh, to make it appear that there is uh, a very kind of a freer civic space, basically. Um, so I think, and this, we have to be very aware of that. We have to be very aware that the, you know, that the sec security apparatus is very much infiltrating all the different uh, state institutions that are responsible uh, for culture. So we have to be uh, aware of that as part of this movement, and we have to deal with it uh, accordingly. Well, thank you so much. And uh, maybe a final question for you both uh, before time, unfortunately, is against us. Uh, were there any chapters that were particularly hard or challenging to write about in terms of the findings or any other aspects? Uh, maybe, Ruba, you'd like to go first on that. Um, yeah, I think uh, the conflict, the chapters under the conflict and governance team were difficult to write in terms of the stories that were being the, the stories that were being reflected because really discussed a lot of betrayal and a lot of like the ways that surveillance um, was ultimately sort of um, how can I say this entrusted to the actual population that someone would look at, for example, their artist friend and report them to the police or to their, their family member or their neighbor and um, how that kind of came about. And that included some very heavy stories of artists, you know, being betrayed by people they know or being reported um, and, you know, being tortured or taken to to warehouses and left there for days and uh, just being saved on the off chance that, you know, they know someone or their family knows someone or something like that. So in terms of that, that was, I think, you know, um, yeah, I think that those were like very difficult stories to sit with when you get to the, the more granular level of, okay, there are very systemic influences happening, but then you get to the granular, granular level of, okay, people really started making personal choices to hurt arts and culture in this way. And you just really see like the level of brainwash that happened in a very real and direct way. Um, and then I think the memory chapters were just difficult to write in terms of the like dense theoretical work that goes into sort of talking some, talking about something like um, collective uh, memory, but ultimately everything was such an honor and such a pleasure to be interested with stories and um, to be able to do this work um at all so yeah just a lot of gratitude as well well thank you so much uh Reem, how about your yourself yeah just to jump in quickly i think uh, i mean in general yeah so i would say all the chapters were difficult because of uh, resources so we did a lot of interviews and of course uh, you know a lot of documentation was kind of missing but also i would say that what was really difficult is to kind of choose what to write on or choose like to focus the book because when you're telling people you're writing a book about this topic, there's so many things that you that that people feel that you should include. There's this almost this burden of like wanting to include everything and of telling the whole story. And this is something we grappled with that we cannot tell the whole story. You can never tell the whole the whole story. You tell part of it, and then you kind of step back and you have this space. And, 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 and you become a primary kind of source and you let other people continue telling the story. So I think for us to come to this conclusion and to kind of feel less guilty, it took some time. But, at, but once we were there, we just felt that, you know what, this is it, we did our work, it's out. And then we, we do want to just continue contributing. And this is one of the things we want to do is we want to kind of digitize some of the sources we use, some of the interviews and so on, just to make sure that we kind of continue giving back to the community and to encourage more people to write. Thank you so much, uh, Reem. Thank you so much, Uruba. Uh, thank you so much to our audience as well. I'm just very mindful of uh, times with at hand, which is against us as always. A very quick question, my final question for uh, uh, colleagues, and I'm thinking, Omnia, you've got your hand up in particular, so you might be best placed to answer. How can we buy the book? 
Oh my God, this is for sure. Um, and I, I have so much to say. I feel so much gratitude to really be here today. Uh, but let me start with where we can find the book or people can find the book. I can, I can find the book everywhere. <laughs> I have the book. Uh, but we've got three ways. So if you're in Sudan or if people are in Sudan, you can buy directly from us for the time being. But it will be launched in bookstores once the Arabic, ones come, the Arabic one comes out, um, hopefully by next month. And then if you're in the East, of Africa part or Eastern Africa part, you can buy through Mahiri books. Um, and we're going to be dropping all these links tomorrow on our page, just kind of, you know, let this event have this final bang um, on our social media. And the third thing, which is a very exciting opportunity that we had through you, Paul and Angelica, um, which is a partnership with the African Books Collective, which means that the book is pretty much um, available worldwide. Um, mostly for the audiences in Europe, America, Canada, and pretty much, you know, the Western Hemisphere. Um, we're trying to build up more distribution channels so our book can be available everywhere. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a way. So if anyone would be interested in buying it and it's not and does not live in Sudan, East Africa, or Western Hemisphere, um, please do reach out and we will uh, try to figure something out for you. The last thing I want to say is that, again, because this book took three years, I really want to send a, a huge thank you to, um, and maybe they're not even in this forum, but I know this is recorded and then you watch it, um, to everyone who's really been part of this journey, editors, writers, um, people who help with logistics and movement, planning, project managers, just everyone who's, who's circled through this project one way or another, um, or contributed to it one way or another from our side at Enderia. Um, and of course, everyone who was instrumental in facilitating so many interviews and, 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 and meetings for, for Reem and Ruba and their um, assistants as well. And the assistants, of course, the due, um, the gratitude is due to them as well. And just really like, it's an incredible journey to be on um, going from a digital magazine to having a published book. And just, yeah, I can't thank people enough. And of course, for you as well, the Center of African Studies and for you, Paul, um, Angelica and Paul, uh, Shabaka, of course, big thank you to Shabaka and, and Bashair, who I met at the time when Andaria was brewing as an idea. So here we are almost, you know, eight years later. Uh, Bashair is, is one of the founders of Shabaka. And I'll leave you here. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Angelica, so much. No, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for uh, your time this evening. I'm just going to hand over to Angelica for a final word uh, before we bid you good evening or good afternoon or possibly good morning somewhere in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ruba and uh, Rim, for a fantastic discussion. I mean, I would definitely buy the book and uh, read. I'm sorry I haven't done it in advance, but uh, I would definitely do it now. It was an incredible discussion. Thank you so much. We will share the link uh, for those who couldn't make it tonight, and uh, we will keep sharing it. Uh, thank you, Paul, for uh, excellent sharing, and uh, thank you for our audience, and I look forward to uh, reconnect it uh, very soon. Thank you, everybody, and uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Clap. <laughs>